and welcome to Scuba Diving Magazine. This top 10 video is sponsored by Aggressor Adventure Liverboards and we're looking at my top 10 tips for liverboard scuba diving because they're a great way to get a whole ton of diving done in very little time and to really get out to see some really amazing dive sites. But if you've never been on one before and you want to be prepared, here are 10 handy tips to improve your liverboard experience. One thing that you will very quickly learn on a liverboard is that they're intensive. And whilst you can do every single dive on the entire itinerary, upwards of four dives a day for five days in a row can really take it out of you. So plan a dive like in the following day or whenever to skip so that you don't burn out and end up missing a great dive because you did go on that 6 a.m. dive before breakfast that was all right, but you know, nothing special. But now you come to the next dive and it's something exciting, but you're too tired to go on it. So a lot of itineraries, they start at 6 a.m. each day. So you're in the water before breakfast, two more dives during the day, and then a dive in the evening in some cases. And then after that, people are socializing and chatting late into the night. So they're quite long days with some high intensity work throughout the day. Don't be surprised if you see a lot of people just sleeping during the day and attendance rates start to drop throughout the trip uh, as people just get more and more tired. But ask which dives are worth skipping uh, so that you can stay a bit more fresh for the rest instead of just going, you know what, I'm just gonna skip the next dive, whatever it is, because you might miss out on something. Look after your ears. Uh, if you're in and out of the water for days, even if you do equalize early and often, your ears can actually hurt over time. What it actually is, is that the skin cells inside of your ears, they swell up with the water because they're saturated and they create little crevices between them that bacteria and nasties find their way into and that can actually cause irritation in the very sensitive outer ear. There are a few treatments to help prevent this uh, that range from preventative care like ear sprays that can coat the inside of your ear to help prevent the nasties from getting into those crevices and helps keep some of the water out from actually getting to your uh, the skin on the inside of your ears. Some divers use simple olive oil because it's nice and natural to help create that like insulating layer on the inside. And you can also find post dive treatments as well that can dry up any moisture and kill any nasties inside of your ear after the dive. If you look up swimmer's ear or otitis externa uh, for treatment and prevention, it's definitely worth investing in a little something to protect your ears because yeah, it's not equalizing, it's actually nasties on the inside and that water, the constant water, that's actually getting a little ear infection. You really don't need a lot on a liverboard, especially when it comes to clothes. For the liverboard itself, you need a few sets of swimwear and a handful of shirts, depending on the climate and the length of stay, obviously. But for like a week long liverboard in the Red Sea in the summertime, I'll bring like three, maybe four pairs of board shorts and the same for shirts for like day to day wear. Then I'll have an extra outfit for travel. And that's really about it. You're typically barefoot all week except for dive boots whilst you're actually on the dive so bring some decent footwear for traveling to and from the airport and all that kind of stuff and that's about it for footwear depending on itineraries obviously if there is this random like hike in the middle then yeah you, you can need it but for for most week-long liverboards you're just out to sea for five or six days and yeah you're, you're barefoot for most of that but actually in my kit bag a good 80 to 90% of what's in my kit bag is dive gear. Uh, you don't need that much clothing whilst on a liverboard. Unless you know about some fancy event as well that you're attending whilst you're on the trip. If they have formal night or something for whatever reason, I've never been on a liverboard with one, but you never know, I might not have been on any of these fancy liverboards. Um, but I wouldn't worry about bringing too much of your wardrobe whilst you're going on a dive trip. A lot of it will come back with you just unworn.
There will come a time during the trip after a dive when you want to go inside to grab something from your cabin before drying yourself off completely. Resist this urge. It could actually kill you if like real worst case scenario. The, the inside areas of liverboards are often polished to a mirror finish. And when wet, the deck just turns into a slip and slide. And on a moving vessel as well, you will fall over uh, and or cause the next person to slip and fall. So try and dry yourself off. And of course, remember to prepare that towel before the dive so you don't have to go inside to dry yourself off. Either that or just wait to drip dry. Dry yourself off properly before actually going inside. Or if you have forgotten your towel, just ask someone else to go grab something, uh, to go grab it on the inside if it's essential. Um, you can normally tell the difference between wet and dry areas of the boat by the deck itself. If it's coarse and rough, then it's wet. Uh, if it's shiny and smooth, you, you have to be dry to be in that area. But with very few like grab handles and rails around you, you don't want to be slipping over, especially on staircases. So keep your feet and the deck as dry as possible. If you're given the choice of which cabin is going to be yours, then try to go as high up and as near the center as possible. A lot of the machinery, like the engine and the compressor, is going to be at the back of the boat and in lower decks as well. So if you're a light sleeper, you might get some engine noises that time if you're in those lower decks and nearer the back. I also find it a little bit stuffy in lower decks. It may just be me and the boats that I've been on, but I tend to prefer upper decks as much as possible for a bit more fresher air. If you're midship as well, you don't get quite as much of the boat movement if that affects you. Um, you'll often find a lot of divers just bringing their pillows up to the top deck to sleep under the stars and in the fresh air during the night. It's very much up to you. Um, you don't de tend to get too many bugs out to sea, so it's still quite pleasant, um, but it can get breezy at times. But if you find that you're bunking on the bottom deck near the aft, be prepared for some engine noise. Now, I find it really easy to relax into a place and end up spreading my stuff all over the place. And I have to really keep focusing on keeping all of my stuff organized and in the right place on the liverboard so it doesn't end up going missing. If it's made to go on a dive, you usually have a crate underneath your kitting up bench to keep all of your dive gear together. So after you're done with your dive computer or whatever it is, then try and stow it away there. If it's dry stuff, try and keep that in your cabin or in like a cubby hole. You often have like little cubby holes on like mid decks to store things in like communal areas. So try to use one of those to put your things in because things that are left out either on the deck or on the tables will be put away for you so they don't either blow away or just roll away. These cubby holes though, they're often nowadays used as charging stations a lot today. More about that a little bit later, um, but there's surprisingly little room on a liverboard and just try to keep your stuff as organized as possible and try and come up with a bit of a routine and uh, a space for each individual thing. So your logbook lives here in your cabin, your reading books and charging cables, they live here, uh, clothes are stowed away here so that you don't end up picking up someone else's towel or something thinking that it's yours because you forgot where yours is. Uh, so yeah, just try and be really regimented and keep things always in the same place each day. After too many horrible boat fires in recent years, you won't be able to leave things charging in your cabin unattended because the wiring in a lot of these boats because they, it's either too old or just the way that boats are wired up, they're not made to supply the number of modern devices. I mean, we didn't have this many rechargeable things when a lot of these boats were actually conceived and it can actually cause overheating and start fires on boats, which is incredibly dangerous. So if you do need to recharge a lot of your equipment, think about each and every piece of equipment and whilst you're near a charging station, having a drink, reading a book, whatever it is, catching up on your suntan, have something just 
topping up and when that's at 100%, swap it over for something else so that you're not trying to charge everything all at the same time. A lot of electronics today, they all charge from a USB fitting, so you don't need to bring quite as many different plugs and adapters for each of your individual electronics as you used to years ago. But think about keeping things charged like your dive torch, your camera, and of course your dive computer if it's rechargeable nowadays. That way you don't end up halfway through a dive and suddenly something dies. If you're ever in doubt for something to do between dives, drink a bottle of water. Breathing the dry air from the cylinders and being out in the salty ocean can dehydrate you quite quickly and it's surprisingly easy to forget to drink water. Most dive boats do make it quite easy for you uh, to stay hydrated because they have water coolers dotted around each deck uh, to just top up a water bottle as you go and they always keep them topped up. Bottles of water are usually available from the start of the trip, but for the sake of the environment, if you can bring your own water bottle, it's better. And also vacuum water bottles are a lot better for keeping the water inside colder for longer. In a warm climate, the water inside of a plastic bottle is gonna warm up pretty quickly. So a metal vacuum bottle just gives you a little bit longer to drink it while it's still cold. If you're new to scuba diving, get your nitrox ticket and use it on a liverboard. After day three of a liverboard, you can usually pick out the nitrox divers from those diving on just plain old air. That extra boost of oxygen just perks you up a little bit. And on some liverboards, it's actually included in the price. So fill your boots or fill your cylinder if you're nitrox certified. Uh, Nitrox improves your diving as well. If you're uninitiated, you don't know what Nitrox does. It will extend your NDL so you can stay down a bit longer and enjoy the dive site longer before your dive computer starts barking at you. But don't worry if you haven't done the course before you leave because the guides on liverboards are usually dive instructors that can teach the Nitrox course between dives along with all sorts of other courses. So you can actually get it done then and there on holiday and then complete the course whilst you're out there. A good insurance policy is a no brainer on a dive trip. So, a lot of tour operators actually insist on insurance, but not all insurance policies are made the same. Some policies have rather crafty clauses that mean that the policy is just voided the moment you go one centimeter beyond your actual qualification maximum depth. Even if it wasn't related to the accident, they can see that on your dive computer and just go, mm, no, you can pay for that. Even if you're a good diver and you stick above your maximum depth limit no matter what. Check what your policy actually covers, including hyperbaric chamber costs, repatriation costs, and look up what that can realistically cost where you're going so you're not caught out. Good diving insurance is not worth skimping on because things can and will go wrong at the worst possible moment, and you wanna make sure that you're covered. Sorry to end that one on a little bit of a downer, but insurance is a very important part of modern scuba diving life today. Uh, if you have any handy liverboard tips and advice that you've picked up over the years for other scuba divers, pop them down in the comments section so they can read up on those. Another quick tip is to hang your stuff inside out between dives so that the inside part of your wetsuit dries first. You know, the bit that actually touches your skin, you want that dry. Uh, it doesn't matter if the outside of your wetsuit is dry. Um, for more things scuba diving, uh, remember to click that subscribe button if you haven't already. Um, thank you for that, if you have. Um, then of course, check out our website where you can sign up to the Scuba Diver magazine. Thank you for watching everybody and safe diving. Oh, and here's some relaxing music to listen to and uh, a couple of links that you can click on.